good morning. Uh, so we're here today with our last uh, lecture this semester uh, in our lecture circle, Kishki Homansi or Criticism and the Novel in English. And we have here a very special guest today, uh, Professor Elei Hashimi Yakani. And uh, well, she will be delivering uh, the, the talk based uh, on her new book entitled Familial Fe Feeling, Entangled Tonalities in Early Black Atlantic Writing and the Rise of the British Novel. And we're really happy to have you here, Lay. But before uh, uh, we start, I would like to say a little bit about uh, Professor Hashimi, who is a, a professor of English and American literature and culture with a focus on post-colonial studies at Humboldt University in Berlin, in Germany. She's the recipient of an ERC consolidator grant for the project Tales of the Diasporic Ordinary Aesthetics of Facts Archives, in which she investigates queer narratives of migration with a comparative focus on Germany, Britain, and the United States. In a new book project tentatively called Mini City. Her research interests include diasporic writing, post-colonial studies, visual culture, cultural memory, and archival churn, queer theory, and intersectionality. In addition to numerous articles and two monographs, familial feeling entangled tonalities in early Black Atlantic writing and the rise of the British novel, which is her most, uh, her latest publication, which was uh, uh, released in 2021, uh, published by Palbrook Macmillan, and uh, was also shortlisted for the Essie Prize, uh, sorry, Essie Book Award 2022, Literatures in the English Language, and The Privilege of Crisis, Narratives of Masculinities in Colonial and Postcolonial Literature, Photography, and Film, uh, which came out with Campus in 2011 and won the Brit Cult Award in 2009. Um, Hashimi Akani has published a third book on revisualizing intersectionality, also with Palgrave Macmillan, released in 2022, and which is also open access. We'll make sure to, to, to post the links to both familial feel, feeling and revisualizing intersectionality here. Um, Together with Professor Sylvie Chakakal, Chaka, uh, sorry, Chakalakal, uh, from the Humboldt University in, in the European Ethnology Department, Professor Ashimi Yakani is the PI of the Princeton Humboldt Strategic Partnership Grant Project, Reimagining the Archives, Sexual Politics and Postcolonial Entanglements. Thank you so much for being here today, Leigh. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much, um, Julia Braga Neves, for the kind introduction and the opportunity to speak here in your series on criticism and the novel. And it's really a shame that I can only be with you digitally today, but it's it's really wonderful to connect um, to colleagues in Brazil. Um, Julia, if you could share the screen, then I think people could follow some of the things that I'm saying. And please, if I'm going too fast, you will you will give me a signal. Um, and otherwise, um, in my lecture today, I'm trying to read this off paper to, to stay somewhat in time because it's quite an ambitious program for one talk. And what I want to do is I will begin by revisiting Edward Said's concept of contrapuntal reading. And you see a little structure here of the overall um, project for today. And I wanna talk a little bit about counterpoint versus what I call entanglement or entangled tonalities in the book. Um, and then try to make this maybe a little bit clearer by um, focusing on two specific um, texts, Jane Austen's Mansfield Park and Robert Wedderburn's The Horrors of Slavery. So let me begin with briefly contextualizing this in the larger framework of my book of, um, as you said, which today's presentation is really a very short glimpse. And as Huya has kindly mentioned, it is open access. So if you want to look up some of the things that I've been saying, you know, feel free 
um, to do so. In familial feeling, I offer an entangled literary history um, of the rise of the novel and the earliest written testimonies by Black British or transatlantic writers in the 18th and early 19th century. So in the book, I use the concept of tonality to describe the shifts in aesthetic registers and the rise of the novel framework from foundations in Daniel Defoe and Olada Equiano to digressions in Lawrence Stern and Ignacio Sancho to resistances in Jane Austen and Robert Wedderburn, and finally consolidations in Charles Dickens and Mary Seacole. And it is the pairing of Austen and Wedderburn that I will discuss in the second part of today's talk in some more detail. So in concert with more recent approaches in the historiography of the British Empire, I hope to foster a view of British literature as part of a global network um, that can only be told as a story of entangled modernities. This temporal frame, framing stands in contrast to the strong focus on the late 19th and 20th century in post-colonial studies and the model of writing back. Entanglements between British and other cultures are not only the result of the migration following World War II, but begin much earlier. The formation of the British nation already in the 17th and 18th century was inextricably linked to the transatlantic trade in human beings and the enslavement in the Americas that gave rise to modern Great Britain as the most important imperial power of its time. However, slavery was not an uncontested status quo. The controversial public discourse ranged from the unapologetic pro-slavery plantocracy to the often evangelical abolitionists and a middle ground that wavered between the two and can be characterized as ameliorationist. Gaining momentum in the late 1780s, the debate on the abolition of slavery has been formative of the British Enlightenment and the emergence of the British middle class. The act of reading as empathic identification with someone else, accelerated by the technological revolutions, that is, increased literacy and faster distribution at the time, becomes crucial for the emotional register of this middle class. And this is where this phrasing familial feeling comes in. This, however, needs to be critically contextualized British culture and the novel in particular can also be seen to support. Um, ah, this is wait. Um, wait, this was too fast. Sorry. This can, so the, the British culture and the novel in particular can also be seen to support, elaborate, and consolidate the practice of empire and affect colonizer and colonized, as Edward Said has argued. So here we go. Accordingly, Said urges scholars to look at the comparative literature of imperialism, to understand different experiences contrapuntally as intertwined and overlapping histories. Said explains that contrapuntal reading emphasizes the influence of the colonies on metropolitan lifestyles. So we can think about the references to Australia and Dickens's Great Expectations or to the West Indies and India and Bronte's Jane Eyre, for instance. But this acknowledgement of interdependency will also always entail an element of possible resistance. Daniel Carey explains Said's contrapuntal reading as follows, quote, as we might expect from the naming of the practice, the first analysis comes from an analogy with music. Said remarks that in classical music, the theory of counterpoint depends on the relationship between multiple themes none of which are dominant. In order to produce meaning, imperial culture has brought forward a structure <clears throat> of reference and attitude, a web of affiliations, connections, which can be read as leaving a set of ghostly notations. So evoking the muted sound of the ghost note of imperialism and colonialism here, much like the figure of the specter that is often cited in the traumatic history of enslavement, the writing of imperialism 
in Said's understanding also entails its own counterpoint. Nevertheless, Said too seems to frame this, this form of contrapuntal reading as a retrospective act, which is supposed to have an harmonious outcome. Daniel Carey criticizes that in post-colonial contrapuntal readings um, of canonical classics, there is a tendency to superimpose anachronistic contemporary categories onto literary text. And that is a, a general critique that shapes much of literary studies concerns about cultural studies methodologies in general and post-colonial readings in particular. In this way, Carey argues Contrapuntal reading quickly turns into what he calls palimpsestic reading, that is, overwriting the original text with another. In addition to Carey's call for postcolonial readings closer to the actual source, I want to emphasize another um, problematic aspect um, in such postcolonial literary reading practice. Too often, these have not taken into consideration the contemporaneous interrelation between metropole and colony and focusing on the metropolitan texts exclusively. Conversely, close readings of early Black British literature tend to overemphasize the colonial subject mimicking colonial culture and thus fail to note the investment in otherness that is necessary for hegemonic self-definition. So we also have to understand that Britain has much to gain in moral standing in highlighting the early Black British um, voices. So Said's contrapuntal reading might be called well-trodden territory in post-colonial studies, but if applied not only retrospectively, contrapuntal reading, or rather a focus on entanglement, as I want to propose, alters histories of modernity. And this path, I argue in, in the book, has not been explored in all its consequences with reference to the emergence of the British um, modern canon. In English literary studies, we are now faced with the rich plurality of English literatures across the globe, and at the same time, witness a return to more canonical sources regarding, regarding English literature writ large in Britain when it comes to decision-making about which texts should be taught in schools and universities and the demands to decolonize syllabi, for example. I want to emphasize the need to apply this globalized lens to English literature in Britain as well. So despite sort of a global agenda, my line of inquiry um, employs a more modest transatlantic perspective. It's sort of a post-colonial entangled re uh, reading predating the high time of imperialism to zoom in on the construction of what I call familial feeling with regard to national belonging and canon formations in Britain. The novel as the predominant form of writing prose that emerged in the 18th century and became more established in the 19th century modified the re registers of how readers thought about families and belonging and who was included in communities of the familiar. Literature is thus one culturally central sphere in which the discourse on effective individualism, which Lawrence Stone famously described, manifested itself. However, if we add a transatlantic perspective to the well-known rise of the novel framework, we see that literature simultaneously functions as the medium of middle class self assertion and of the emotive claim to subject status by those who have been included, excluded, sorry, from the realm of the human, the family of man. Literature tests the limit of acceptable subjects and objects of emotional attachments. It regulates and challenges assumptions about individual agency and communal belonging. Therefore, I would say that my entangled perspective avoids referring to Black British writers in the 18th and 19th century as a mere curious fact, but acknowledges their presence as indeed formative for the construction of Britishness, which we now imagine having become a challenged identity only under the auspices of 20th century migration. So 
Bearing in mind the work by queer scholars on negative affects, I also want to be clear that we should not overemphasize the achievements of revolutionary sort of modern black subject, subjects whose testimonies have survived to this day. So that is to say that in contrast to some of the more congratulatory contemporary British memorial culture, I do not wish to celebrate an all too sort of happy multiculturalism in the past, especially when we're thinking about the histories of enslavement. I think we need to take very seriously the absences in the archive, and, and Julia has mentioned that I've been doing quite a bit of work on, on those forms of archive formations, um, and also understand entanglement as a form of um, acknowledging complexities and complexities that include um, self-authorization by collusion with the imperial endeavor. And, and that is something that black authors often had to do if they wanted to be heard. Um, but there are also, of course, resisting tonalities. And this is what I'm trying to highlight today. So I hope that following this sort of more theoretical framing um, in the first part of, of my talk, I want to now demonstrate a little bit more concretely how such an entangled reading practice might look like by discussing Jane Austen's canonical third published novel, Mansfield Park, together with the horrors of slavery from 1824, a text by the radical orator Robert Wedderburn. And I argue that it's specifically the construction of what I call familial feeling that characterizes these texts as an arena in which agency was claimed and contested. Okay, so here, here we go, sort of trying to delve a little bit deeper into one particular moment. And this is um, sort of the, the early 19th century, right? And this is a period of transition, both in international colonial and domestic familial terms. Following um, the 1807 abolition of the slave trade, not slavery, um, the system and realities of enslavement did not vanish overnight. So, so we have to sort of also stop thinking about this idea somehow that there was enslavement and there was abolition. It's a really sort of long phase of um, transition. And many people would argue we have never reached the, the stage of true abolition, of true freedom. And so I think it's an interesting moment in history where there seems to be a general British public consensus in favor of gradual emancipation, but the steps this might involve were quite controversial. There was widespread fear of insurgents in the Caribbean and both the horrors of slavery and Mansfield Park mark a shift from the old plantation system based on British absentee planters um, to a new form of imperial capitalism that gains prominence in the course of the 19th century. So published in 1814, Mansfield Park's plot either takes place directly preceding or following the abolition of the slave trade in 1807. The novel recounts how class mobility coincides with a new form of familial emotionality um, and belonging. Said rests his famous analysis of the text on the premise that in Austen's pre-imperialist novel, blood relation is no longer sufficient to uphold the continuity of familial heritage. What emerges instead is a pattern of affiliation. So the imprudent choice of marriage that separates the three ward sisters who become Lady Bertram, Mrs. Norris and Mrs. Price, respectively, is the outset of this economic family drama. Forced by circumstance, Mrs. Price appeals to her estranged sister and her rich husband, Sir Thomas Bertram, to, make, to take in their daughter, Fanny. This is facilitated in part, at least, through the return from the Antiguan plantation of the family. Fanny's feeling when she arrives of being out of place in Mansfield Park is enhanced by the sheer size of the surroundings. Overwhelmed by the demands of effective individualism that her new class mobility entails, her lacking expression of the right kind of enthusiastic emotionality is interpreted as sulkiness by Mrs. Norris. 
the heterodiegetic narrator too repeatedly comments on the discrepancy between expected feeling and Fanny's perceived ungratefulness. She only settles in once the younger son, Edmund, who's planning to enter the clergy, which was quite common for second um, born sons, becomes her friend and helps Fanny also to keep in touch with her other male um, confidant, her older brother, William, who embarks on a career in the Navy. With the death of Mr. Norris sometime later and the poor returns from the um, estate in the Antigua, there's some disruption in the familial framework. And this brings me to Said's famous assessment of the novel. Said is highly critical of the imbalance in representing the settings in England and Antigua, which is never described in the text directly. He also ultimately reads Fanny as complicit with her slave owning uncle. Unsurprisingly, there was a boom in post-colonial readings of Mansfield Park in the wake of Said's culture and imperialism in the second half of the 1990s. And there's now, there's now strong disputes about such interpretations, um, including charges of misquoting and misnaming individual characters, as in the famous silence surrounding slavery in Mansfield Park, and I will return to this. So we can now see how Austin criticism itself has become a battlefield of post-structuralist versus more traditional philological schools of literary interpretation. Now, more than 30 years after Said's reading was first published, there also seems to be a worrying incipient backlash against both feminist and post-colonial literary criticism. And I'm happy to discuss this more if this is of interest to you. Said himself evidently struggled with a desire for a simultaneous literary absolution um, and a post-colonial reprobation of Austin's political views. Trying to avoid a banal, as he called it, rhetoric of blame, he wants to call out Austen on her politics and celebrate her as part of the great tradition. And Said is, of course, correct in highlighting that the restricted English world of Austen's Mansfield Park knows no black agency like Robert Wedderburn's, which will, I will discuss later. But this does not quite amount to unquestioned male authority. In this context, I think it is interesting to note that while Said mentions Mansfield Park's status as pre-imperialist, as I've shown, but he does not really inquire into its status as post-abolition. As George Bullockus persuasively points out, the most problematic aspect in this framing is the idea that a critique of slavery is an anachronistic demand of post-colonial scholars when, in fact, the debate on the abolition of slavery is contemporary to Austin. So ambivalence is not something we retrospectively need to attach to the politics of the author, it is already present in the text. Austin's familiarity with the topic of slavery is well established, and especially the title Mansfield Park is widely noted to allude to Lord Mansfield, who had ruled in the Somerset case of 1772, that the fugitive James Somerset um, could not be resold into slavery since he had already entered British soil. This is seen as in, by many as the beginning of Britain's quite paradoxical exceptional standing on outlawing slavery um, at home, while still profiting financially from the plantations abroad for at least the following 60 years. And that is again, directly predating the fictional present um, of the novel. So we have to be quite aware that slavery is not, is not present in the daily lives of British people, but they were highly invested in it. And again, I, I'm happy to sort of discuss this more. So hence the setting Mansfield Park is entangled with slavery in the Caribbean rather than its blissful domestic counterpart as which Said describes it. David Bartin and Eileen McGuire make a similar point in offering a complex reevaluation of Said's model of counterpoint. 
Um, there is now a question, I think. I have a question was also on record in her letters condemning slavery. When she's talking about slavery, there's some letters to her sister that have now uh, been published and she did read abolitionist books. So there is some understanding. But I think um, one thing that I would say, and we can talk about this more, is that it is misleading in this debate around abolition to assume a for or against, because amelioration is a very dominant cultural um, discourse. Um, and I'll talk about this a little bit more. And George Bullock's work on this is really, really quite helpful. So maybe we can come back to this in the end and discuss this a little bit more. So I really think it's the, the wrong impulse if we keep trying to um, reduce this question, as is often done, is was Austin a, a sort of abolitionist or not? That, I think, is not necessarily the most central question to this debate. I'll come back to it, and, and, and we, I'm happy to discuss this more later. OK, so let's try and, and go back to this question um, of counterpoint. Um, so the, the two uh, critics that I was just quoting, Bartin and McGuire, um, they they take up this idea that counterpoint transfers the musical capacity to juxtapose two different themes that are uttered simultaneously to literary readings. Um, and they distinguish tonal and dissonant counterpoint to highlight that counterpoint can not only produce harmony, as Said argues. So again, and this is maybe an answer already to your question, I want to be clear, my main concern in the following is not the dispute whether Austin, the real life person and author, was proto-feminist or a moralist conservative, whether she was opposed to the slave trade or support, supported British imperialism, or in this case, both, which I'm personally inclined to believe. Rather, I want to understand how familial feeling is constructed in relation to Britain's role as an increasingly imperial rather than slaveholding nations. So I think that is actually the more interesting transition that is taking place. So to this end, it's certainly um, opposite to demand close attention to the textual makeup of the novel and how it addresses the coincidence of the qualms about the role of women and the status of formerly enslaved human beings. In clear contrast to John Wiltshire then, who in a reductive and I would say, frankly, quite hostile remark claims post-colonial criticism, in fact, has colonized Mansfield Park. I believe we need to engage with rather than dismiss earlier post-colonial and feminist analyses of a canonical text that relies on silences and illusion. Wiltshire argues that the association of Mansfield Park with Lord Mansfield is a far-fetched, ideologically inclined reading. He also questions whether the financial dependence on the Antiguan plantation is given undue credit by post-colonial critics. And most importantly of all, he contests the validity of analyses that claim an analogous relationship between the marriage market and or governess trade uh, with the slave trade. And given the fact that middle class white women were increasingly able to resist being married off against their will, as is evident in Mansfield Park, um, this is actually, I think, an interesting point. So I believe Wiltshire's emphasis on post-colonial, as he calls it, obvious misreadings and his entirely misplaced use of the term decolonizing to describe his attempts to unfetter Austin criticism um, from such supposedly sort of ideologues betrays on his part a longing for a restoration of an unambiguous authoritative literary criticism predating any post-structuralist uncertainty. And so I, I cannot emphasize enough that I strongly disagree with the, what comes across as a conservative anti-feminist and anti-post-colonial sort of rescue of the true Austin, which is something that always pops up when people adapt the play, or the, the novels, when, you know, when people want to try and engage with it from a modern perspective. I do, however, believe that there is a point in emphasizing the limits of the problematic analogy of women's status as slaves within patriarchal family constellations. Not only does such a framing ignore the gender of enslaved um, people and especially black women, 
It also downplays white women's agency within colonial power relations. And this has been, of course, widely noted um, by other scholars. So to do justice to these interdependent processes of othering, I propose a more nuanced reading of Fanny's expression of familiar feeling that places greater emphasis on the representation of emotional ambivalence in the actual text. Um, and this I call with a slight play on Foucault, her will to feel, that is shaped by a new form of realistic introspection and uncertainty regarding expected emotionality. As mentioned, the Bertram family is difficult emotional terrain for the outsider. On the one hand, Fanny feels grateful and wants to please, and at the same time, She's often overwhelmed by her own emotional and one has to add also religious demands of a morality. And this co coincides with surprise and anger at the indiscretion of those who should be morally more refined than she is. The Bertram daughters, for instance, appear spoiled and more interested in a good match or exciting distractions than finding true companionship. Hence, the critique of familial power relations in Mansfield Park is not simply directed at the men. The scheming women, specifically Lady Bertram and Aunt Norris, are as much to blame. In contrast to her cousins then, who were born into a social standing that prepared them for being courted, and the worldly Crawfords to whom courtship feels like a competition, Fanny is depicted as actually caring um, about other people's feelings. Preparing her for her outing, Fanny would like to wear the amber cross that her brother William gives her as a present, um, but for which he could not afford a matching gold chain. Mary Crawford presses her into wearing a necklace she originally uh, received from Henry. Fanny's emotional confusion is only enhanced when Edmund also presents her with the necklace um, so by now, just to give you a little bit of context of the plot, Fanny has also fallen for Edmund, who, unaware of Fanny's feelings, in turn is smitten by Mary's kindness. So she finally solves her dilemma by wearing both necklaces to the ball. This episode has become one of several instances in the novel where one can draw a figurative connection between white women's status on the marriage market as akin to enslavement, as the necklaces have been read as alluding to chains, reading Fanny literally as the slave in Sir Thomas's household. But while Fanny is indeed bound to the Bertram, Bertrams, her relation to Sir Thomas, I would argue, is much more ambivalent than unchallenged patriarchal power of a quasi-slaveholder. It is shaped by fear, awe, later, and when he shows more affection towards her, she feels emotionally confused and overwhelmed yet again. Much of Mansfield Park's plot revolves around challenged paternal authority rather than straightforward control, literally at home and figuratively as colonial rule abroad. The tonal ambivalence of the entire novel to a large degree rests on the domestication of the free indirect discourse representing Fanny's ambivalent fam familial feeling into the marriage plot supplied by narrator summary in the closing remarks, and um, I will come back to this. This also relates to the supposedly all overpowering position of the patriarch in the text, whose absence is the precondition for the ensuing sexual liberties and familial drama. The male absentee planter is confronted with two entangled geographies of familial disorder in England and the Caribbean. And Moira Ferguson even speculates about a possible sexual transgression of Sir Thomas in Antigua. But leaving these extra textual speculations aside, the greatest challenge to Sir Thomas's role as part of familiars is the preparation of a private theatrical production in, the abs in his absence in Mansfield Park. The intertext is Elizabeth Inchball's 1798 popular play Lo Lovers Vows, an adaptation of the German Das Kind der Liebe of 1780 by August Kotzebue. In the play, Frederick is a bastard like Robert Weatherburn, who I'll talk about a little bit later, and he voices disdain towards his father. 
In exact opposition, Fanny, up to this point, is the dutiful niece or daughter of an absent uncle slash father. So given the delicate subject matter of the drama, both Fanny and Edmund agree that the play is, quote, exceedingly unfit for private representation. And the unexpected early return of Sir Thomas ends the theatricals and marks the reconfiguration of familial order that also leads to a newfound emotionality towards Fanny. So this novel form of familial feeling, however, also again adds to Fanny's ongoing emotional confusion and more than anything feels oppressive. Calling her his dear Fanny, kissing her affectionately and observing with decided pleasure how much she has grown, Fanny knew not how to feel nor where to look. The strain from the colonial turmoil is compensated in an emphasis on domesticity. This new emotionality and Sir Thomas's wish to talk about Antigua suddenly shaped the domestic mood at Mansfield Park. In contrast to his own children, Fanny becomes quite intrigued by this as the central passage on slavery, the mentioned famous dead silence that ensues when she asks him about slavery underlines. To gain a better understanding of this passage, I quote it at some length and you can read it on the slide, how the conversation between Edmund and Fanny, who summarized the events in the family circle the night before unfolds. This dialogue is shaped by Fanny's unease about Edmund, who is still not aware of her feelings for him, repeating some of the compliments that Sir Thomas had extended to her. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> the evenings do not appear long to me. I love to hear my uncle talk of the West Indies. I could listen to him for an hour together and entertains me more than many other things have done. But then I'm unlike other people, I dare say. Your uncle is disposed to be pleased with you in every respect, and I only wish he would talk to him more. You are one of those who are too silent in the evening circle. But I do talk to him more than I used. I'm sure I do. Did not you hear me ask him about the slave trade last night? I did, and was in hopes the question would be followed up by others. It would have pleased your uncle to be inquired of father. And I longed to do it, but there was such a dead silence. And while my cousins were sitting by without speaking a word or seeming at all interested in the subject, I did not like, I thought it would appear as if I wanted to set myself off at their expense by showing a curiosity and pleasure in his information, which he must wish his own daughters to feel. So while many critics like Said argue that Fanny addresses a taboo subject, recent commentators are much more hesitant about what the dead silence signifies and who si whose silence this includes, her cousins, her uncles, or both. In an attempt to read closer to the text, Bulokos warns that such post-colonial readings might be overdetermined. Instead, he highlights that Fanny is silent because her female cousins shun the topic. Her uncle, at least in Edmund's view, would have been pleased to be inquired of father. Bullockus thus understands this conversation as showcasing Fanny's modesty, not trying to stand out at the expense of Mariah and Julia. He further argues that it is in fact Said, Said's contemporary qualms with the literary archive of how to address issues like slavery and imperialism in high literary criticism that causes such misplaced emphasis on the silence on slavery. In the late 18th and early 19th century, there's no need for such delicacy as slavery is a widely addressed topic in public and literary discourse. Bulukos says, says Austin could reasonably expect her readers Connect to connect it to a very familiar, indeed culturally central discourse. Said's method, which necessi necessitates recovering the repressed, the repressed presence of slavery and colonialism, depends on denying the familiarity of the slave trade as a topic of discussion. 
So in relation to Austin's contemporaries, we have to be careful not to construct a simplistic binary of for or against slavery, but need to understand that positions which were critical of the inhumanity of the slave trade could still be reconciled with ameliorationist versions of a reformation of the plantation system in the early 19th century that still relied heavily on racist notions of the inferiority of black people. So both what we would consider politically progressive and conservative discourses, both reproduce very problematic notions of what, why this is the case. And precisely because these subject matters could fit into the narrative of familial uplift as a civilizing care for the colonies, they were entirely plausible as topics um, of polite conversation. But the growing financial insecurity from the Caribbean system of enslavement also leads to a new interest in imperial expansion in Africa and Asia that shapes the second half of the 19th century. And in the book, I discuss this in relation to Dickens and Mary Seacole's writing. Generically situated between country house and domestic novel, everything following the aborted theatricals in true Austin manner revolves around securing the right kind of marriages for all protagonists. We've lost Julia. I hope she logs back in and I hope I'm still live. If not, please send me some kind of sign. But for now, I will just try and continue. I I, th I think she lost her connection, but okay. probably she's watching from uh, herself from mobile from her mobile phone. But okay. she will soon be back. But 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 sure. but she's watching. You are still alive. <laughs> okay, good. Then I'll continue. Okay, Again, please, I'm, almost please. Done, I'm almost done with the with the awesome part. So I hope you can still um, bear with me for a little bit. So with the Bertram sisters leaving Mansfield Park for London following Mariah's wedding. Henry Crawford confesses his plans to marry Fanny to his sister, Mary. Fanny's emotional composition is tied repeatedly to her status as an object of exchange between the Bertram and the Crawford families, leading her to experience utmost confusion of contrary feeling. Having never expected to be in a situation where she has to reject a suitor, Fanny fights with her troubled rivaling affections for her brother and Edmund, as well as her continuous repudiation of the unwanted attention from Crawford. The third book, accordingly, begins with Fanny's rejection of Crawford, marking her emotional agency. Paradoxically, then, the modern female sub-individual puts her own desires before the familial concerns of lineage and reputation here, which in turn, is interpreted as too much emotionality and immaturity. Her uncle accuses her of a new form of modern female willfulness and perverseness. This highlights the conflicted terrain of selfless familial affection as opposed to a charitable project of reform. Fanny continuously struggles to fulfill the obligations of sympathy in her role as a progressively independent feeling subject with genuine emotionality. According to Sarah Ahmed's study on willful subjects, expressions of will and compliance are closely related to the capacity to resist. In order to become free then, Fanny must resist notions of obligation. Nonetheless, the final pairing of Fanny and her cousin Edmund, with whom she grew up like a brother after all, as well as her enchantment with her naval brother William, highlights the leveling of Fanny's aspirations for emotional modernity into what many have described as an incestuous version of Little England in the end. So the eventual mutual effective attachment they develop for each other is only very briefly commented on in the last chapter, which opens with the um, narrator emphasizing, my Fanny must have been happy in spite of everything. She must have been happy, and she must have been a happy creature in spite of all that she felt or thought she felt. The narrator affectionately lays claim to the protagonist as my Fanny, and at the same time, the narrative uh, 
the narrative discourse suddenly cannot access the principal focalizer's emotional register. There's no free and direct thought anymore explaining Fanny's emotions. It's quite the opposite. The narrator proclaims happiness despite the lack of representation of all that she felt or thought she felt. With regard to this passage, Judith Burden directs our attention once again um, uh, to the use of irony in Austen, to those insistent musts that punctuate her narrative and train our ears to hear the opposites that lies within them. The narrator continues, I only entreat everybody to believe that exactly at the time when it was quite natural that it should be so, and not a week earlier, Edmund did cease to care about Miss Crawford and became as anxious to marry Fanny as Fanny herself could desire. This narrator summary no longer leaves room for the confused emotional introspection of the heroine, but gives precedence to the queer temporality of heterosexuality, the time when it was quite natural that it should be so, which shapes the Victorian ideal of domesticity and the future establishment of the domestic novel in the years to come. So in how far this should be framed as parody, as Claudia Johnson would have it, is not entirely clear. However, Austen's novel depicts, and that is probably for the first time, a degree of female emotional ambivalence that, while not letting go of the ideal of the family altogether, makes it more self-reflexive than before. Mansfield Park, I argue, offers resisting tonalities precisely because of the incongru incongruity between an ultimately conservative narrative voice that and the supposed authenticity of the vocalizer's agitated mixed emotions. And this topic of agitation finally brings me um, to Robert Wedderburn's The Horrors of Slavery. And I hope you could still, still bear with me. I have a little bit to go, but I think we're hopefully um, still there sooner or later to get into the, the conversation. So let me say a little bit more about him. Born in Jamaica as the son of a Scottish planter and an enslaved woman named Rosanna, Robert Wedderburn came to England a free man in 1778 or 1779 and became a Unitarian preacher. Editor Ian McCormon calls Wedderburn a tavern orator, debater and singer, as well as a radical preacher and performer. In contrast to more prominent early transatlantic writers, like self-educated and highly respectable Olado Equiano, Wedderburn does not hide the fact that he was once imprisoned for blasphemous libel. Focusing on an exchange of letters between Wedderburn and Amos Campbell, Peter Linnebaugh and Marcus Redeker in The Many-Headed Hydra famously read Wedderburn as a theorist of the Atlantic proletariat. However, in The Horrors of Slavery, which is the title of his short abolitionist autobiography and somewhat obscure political pamphlet that was published in 1824, as well as in his letters, Wedderburn repeatedly invents fictional addressees. So the exchange with this alleged half-sister, Miss Campbell, whose existence historians Linnebaugh and Redeker accept as factual, is now more widely questioned. Both McCallman and Morris interpret this as Wedderburn's attempt to give the impression of a community of correspondence, as, as Morris uh, says. Writing is used here not only to claim individuality, it is employed strategically to evoke a community of solidarity, and even if that community is invented. Early Black Atlantic writing needs to be situated in more ambivalent aesthetic and political context than simply discern the supposed radicalness of these first published texts by Black authors that are also often reduced to biographical readings. The literariness of Wedderburn is not so much a question of style, which is often characterized as oral, given his practice as a public speaker, but of understanding writing as a direct tool in the call for action, disregarding the distinction of fact and fiction, as well as the demands of literary originality. 
Wedderburn's prose is probably the least polished and therefore might also sit less easily within my entangled account of how the British novel rose to generic fame. But I do believe that the text quite um, uniquely uses notions of willful familiarity that are based in novelistic conventions, as well as imagine a new inclusive transnational audience. And this, I think, can be understood as a, as, a, as a black male counterweight to the white female introspection that Austen presents. I read The Horrors of Slavery as a wayward literary text that moves further away from sentimentalism and challenges conventions of familial feeling by plagiarizing well-established abolitionist discourse and claiming a new form of mixed race subjectivity in writing. In many ways, entanglement once more highlights that the neat boundaries between Austen's supposed conservatism as opposed to Wedderburn's radicalness will only get us this far. Like Austen's Mansfield Park, the horrors of slavery is no longer simply sentimental in tone as we would associate it more with the 18th century sort of discourse. But in contrast, to the more famous domestic novel, it does not embrace the ideal of self-reform, which is to become central to Victorian conceptions of familial care and the domestic novel. While Austen's heroine, Fanny Price, dismisses her less respectable Portsmouth working class family in favor of the more orderly world of the Bertrams, her struggles are, are depicted as internal only. Wedderburn uses his family history as an exemplum to demand global justice. Wedderburn does not emphasize Englishness or Scottishness for that matter, and effective bonds with his fellow Christians as the more common sentimental abolitionist discourse would. He combines sentimental pathos with a new unrespectable, unrespectable and resisting tone. This embrace of being a social failure and his resistance to narratives of self-improvement could even be read as a truly sort of anti-social queer move avant la lettre. The text opens with the conventional sentimental strategies of abolitionist writing by attributing the eponymous horrors of slavery to white cruelty. This is almost always linked to the disregard of familial ties. But Wedderburn's family narratives is unabashedly recalcitrant. On the one hand, the horrors of slavery is surely the most overtly political intervention into British hegemony from a black perspective at the time. On the other hand, there is also longing for family that is quite unique. Looking back at his life, the more than 60 year old Wedderburn opens his account. To my unfortunate origin, I must attribute all my miseries and misfortunes. Through this unapologetic acknowledgement of interracial sexualized violence, Wedderburn's text repudiates idealized family, um, family conceptions, right? So, so Olado talk, talks about, you know, religiosity, providence, all of these positive things. Wedderburn doesn't necessarily. Um, and he shows the intimate entanglements between the Caribbean and Britain. The source of stigma, however, here is not his black, but specifically his white heritage. He writes, I must explain at the outset of the, this history what will appear unnatural to some. The reason of my abhorrence and indignation at the conduct of my father. From him, I have received no benefit in the world. By him, my mother was made the object of his brutal lust, then insulted abused and abandoned. And within a few weeks from the present time, a younger and more fortunate brother of mine, the aforesaid A. Colville Esquire, has had the insolence to revile her memory in the most abusive language and to stigmatize her um, for that which was owing to the deep and dark iniquity of my father. Can I contain myself at this or have I not the feeling of human nature within my breast? So his seemingly unnatural disavowal of his father is rooted in the inhumanity of treating his mother as his property. And this family heritage is complicated 
by reversing color-coded and racialized hierarchies, describing his black mother's stigma as an effect of his white father's moral lapse, his dark inequity. And it's precisely Wedderburn's capacity to feel like any other human being that torments the son of an abandoned mother who still wishes to establish bonds with his white father. The true horror of slavery um, in Wedderburn's writing then is not, is not slavery in the literal sense, which he never experienced firsthand, but his familiarity with both his father's abuse and his mother's suffering. Convicted of blasphemy, if convicted for blasphemy, connected to radicals and pornographers, Wedderburn is not a compliant sentimental figure on whom easy sympathy can be bestowed, although he, like other abolitionists before him, claims humanity via the capacity to feel. His published testimony in the 1820s, we have to remember, is quite still quite exceptional for a black writer. Um, and it's an important means to claim subject status and quote, to say what I am and who were the authors of my existence. He's testifying to how he was written in his, into his unfortunate circumstances, the product of several competing scripts, it seems, among them his conversion to Christianity and political radicalism seem inter intimately intertwined with his family history. The ubiquitous sentimental question, hath not a slave feeling, is dutifully quoted, or we could even say plagiarized, by Wedderburn to explain and defend his mother's rebellious temper. Wedderburn stresses uh, in full, hath not a slave feelings. If you starve them, will they not die? If you wrong them, will they not revenge? Insulted on one hand and degraded on the other, was it likely that my poor mother could practice the Christian virtue of humility when her Christian master provoked her, her to wrath? But more than the abolitionist claim to feeling, Lynn Innes reads this passage as an adaptation of Shylock's famous speech in Shakespeare's The Merchant of Venice. Christian and Jew in Shakespeare, and master and slave in Wedderburn are similar in their physical wants, their bodies' capabilities more alike and different in their need for nourishment. But still, these similarities are violently overlooked. Departing from the abolitionist familial form formula, am I not a man and a brother, Wedderburn, Wedderburn's mother is granted similarity in feeling, but a new, or we could uh, say also say older, less compliant Shakespearean form of agency that also implies revolt. Accordingly, Wedderburn's appeal to sameness must be read not as a call for white benevolence, but rather as the origin of black anger and revolutionary threat. If you wrong them, will they not revenge? Slavery here is not a pitiful spectacle that white sentimentalism can bemoan as a distant past. It threatens Britain's contemporary social peace, which Wedderburn's references to bloodshed in Haiti only underlines. The fear of such incendiary rhetoric in the context of the terror of revolution, both exemplified in the events in France and Haiti, was often seen as contributing to a backlash um, against the early abolitionist campaign headed by William Wilberforce, whose bills to abolish the slave trade were rejected repeatedly in the early 1790s. And one of the reasons why the abolitionist movement only succeeded once the political climate had become calmer in 1807 eventually. Sometimes Wedderburn rhetorically denounces violence. At other times, he proclaims that an uprising will be the result of continued support for the plantation economy. Wedderburn evokes an, we could speculate, an imaginary entangled audience, both in Britain and the Caribbean, including planters and enslaved white men and women, as well as people of color. Wedderburn continuously inverts expectation. It is not the overtly sexuality of the black woman that corrupts his father, but the morally damaging effects of money, especially if used in dealing in human beings. He writes, while my dear and honored father was poor, he was chaste as any Scotchman, 
whose poverty made him virtuous. But the moment he became rich, he, became, he gave loose to his um, carnal appetite. Honest working Scotchmen are cleared from carnal sins and the detested father can be envisioned as once more dear and honored. Epitaphs he repeatedly uses strategically to address both his father and his assumed brother. Wedderburn continues his account by juxtaposing his father's lacking education, my father's mental powers were none of the brightest, with his mother's abilities who had received an education which perfectly qualified her to conduct a household in the most agreeable manner. So the praise um, for his mother continues. His father gave him freedom, so he never had to endure slavery, but it is in fact his mother's insubordinate temper that he really cherishes. The perversion of the plantation system is the simultaneous familiarity and lack of familial affection which becomes more than obvious when Wedderburn rec recounts how a young man flogs his own grandmother, a woman who had brought him up, this young will villain from eight years of age until now, he had treated her as a mother. So the sexual and familial intimacy of the plantation for a long time was considered safely separate from the ordered dom domesticity in Britain and Mansfield Park is obviously a case in point. Nevertheless, as Wedderburn stories shows, scruples and enslaving their own children seem to have persuaded more and more slave owners, or some slave owners at least, to grant their offspring freedom, probably unsuspecting that they would or could cross the Atlantic to claim a part in the family. To do so publicly, as Wedderburn did, was an unheard um, uh, affront that his half-brother tries to stop by threatening him with legal action. Ending up poor in Britain, Wedderburn had sought financial support from his mentioned white Scottish half-brother, A. Colville, calling him an affectionate brother who refused to relieve me. Once Wedderburn publishes account, his account, Colville contests Wedderburn's parentage as contrived and adamantly maintains that his father never had any connection of that kind with the mother of this man. Wedderburn, in turn, disputes this, his white half-brother's attempts to exonerate their father while simultaneously claiming a share in the profits from the sugar plantation. And here you do see, of course, with this question of agency, a very paradoxical demand for an anti-slavery campaigner, it would seem. This correspondence, as well as the letters of the editors of Bell's Lives in London, is included in the Horrors of Slavery. So it's a very mixed kind of a text. The intermediary voice of the editors clearly sides with Wedderburn's account, polemically now the abolitionist slogan, as well as another reference to Shakespeare, and this is Hamlet this time, recurs and is tested when it comes to blood relations at we as Wedderburn's and Colville's correspondence is framed by the mocking brother or no brother, that is the question. The possibly fictional editors even argue that as a gesture of reconciliation, it is precisely the acceptance of such offspring into the realm of the familial that could be the beginning of healing the wounds of slavery. They call for an inclusion of the quote bastard into the realm of the family. An offspring that should be the more closely cemented by the ties of affection, let then the bonds of sympathy lighten the bondage to which they were however unjustly born. The interracial family is imagined as a locus of effective reunion in the aftermath of slavery. And to a certain degree, this framing of interracial identity also reoccurs, and that is not unproblematically, in Britain's contemporary emphasis on interracial families in national memorial culture. And I, I write a bit more about this contemporary um, discourse around uh, memorial culture in the conclusion of the book. Wedderburn seems to indulge a certain pride from his black maternal resilience as much as from the violent undertones of his white Scottish ancestry. From time to time, he distances himself from the atrocity, atrocities of his slave-owning Scottish ancestors and simultaneously wants to be included in this rebellious Scottish tribe 
repeatedly speaking fondly again of his dear grandfather, who was a Jacobite rebel and was executed and who was most certainly would not have accepted him as kin. So linking Scottish and Jamaican histories, the Wedderburn family exemplifies how national rivalries um, between the English and the Scottish and the colonialism on the British Isles had concrete global effects with Jamaica becoming an exile and way to uphold family income for the time being until a return of the Jacobite offspring, um, offspring seemed feasible. While Mansfield Park demonstrate, demonstrates that slavery has in fact become a topic of polite conversation in early 19th century Britain, the tone of address seems tenuous. And part of this tenuousness, I believe, has to do with the slowly increasing visibility of mixed, of mixed race offspring in the metropole that showcases the lack of moral superiority that is supposedly attached to whiteness. And this challenges familial and familiar, um, familiar uh, narratives. Publishing his pamphlet, addressing audiences as a public speaker, but also in his letters to his half-brother, Wedderburn's account disrupts the familial separation that British families sought to uphold for as long as possible. In Mansfield Park, the colonies are an abstract and distant realm of fam familial obligation, and no character from Antigua ever becomes a speaking subject, in Ahmed term, uh, terms, a willful subject. However, as with all Black writing of the period, not only the familial lineage, but also authorship remains complicated regarding, for instance, the questionable literacy and a possible amanuensis of Wedderburn. Penchek emphasizes the mentioned oral style of the horrors of slavery and argues Wedderburn not only appropriates wholesale other texts into his own, but also probably invents other voices with which he ent to enter into dialogue. Can one hence align not only his mixed heritage, but also um, his disputed authorial qualities with, I, with what I've been calling his willful resisting tone? Wedderburn could be interpreted as a revolutionary modern black individual or the voices of the masses, the voice of the masses, depending on whether one reads his text as an expression of individual style as an author and storyteller or decodes him simply as an intertextual convolute. Penchek, like Linnebaugh and Redeker before him, clearly favor a reading of Wedderburn as challenging modern conceptions of individuality. He writes, however memorable the individual Wedderburn may be, in polemical action, his voice becomes the voice not of a revolution, not of a revolutionary, but of the revolution. His anonymity is intolerable because it threatens fundamental assumptions of personal individuality. In terms of literary voice, this seems plausible. However, if we look at the effective politics of the text, it is a very specific family history of Wedderburn that seems to lend the horrors of slavery moral weight and pushes the text in the direction of individualized testimony. Wedderburn's polyphonous account includes standard tropes of sentimentality, but moves them in a different, unrespectable direction. So intervening into the separate spheres of home versus colony, Wedderburn's account is certainly not novelistic in style, but can still be regarded in conjunction with the more domestic narratives of its time. In post-colonial and feminist criticism, it's not enough to state the symbolical analogies between enslaved people and white women. Entanglement here also means to complicate such notions from an intersectional perspective that does not neatly separate gender and race as exclusive categories that should be understood as a heuristic device to provide a transnational lens um, on the rise of the British novel. And such an understanding entanglement becomes a counterweight to the idea that counterpoint is only a retrospective possibility of interpretation. 
each in their own way, while they might not please readers' contemporary effective desires for a feminist heroine or black infallible revolutionary, Austin's and Wedderburn's texts contribute to an entangled, expanding literary representation of familial feeling at the beginning of the 19th century. Thank you so much. I look forward to your questions and my apologies for rambling on, but it was quite a challenge to try and bring um, in all of those different strands. So, yes. Thank you so much, Alay, for this uh, uh, really interesting and fascinating talk. Um, I have a few questions. We also got uh, um, um, one more question from our mysterious viewer, Dot and Kangaroo, uh, but we'll get to that in a second. Um, well, I think I'm going, um, I mean, I'm going to wait for, I mean, please do leave your questions uh, here in, uh, uh, in the chat box and we'll, uh, we'll get to them. Uh, but before that, I, I want to start with a, a very general question before mm -hmm. going into um, your analysis of Austin and Wedderburn. Mm -hmm. um, so if you want to, yeah, sorry, if you want to, I think you can also close the screen. Otherwise, we'll just look at this. Oh, screen. yeah, definitely. Thank you. Yes. Super. Wait, now it's oh. back. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Priscilla and I hit it um, at once uh, at the same time. So uh, um, one thing that interested me um, in your in your research as a whole for this book, right? And it it also has to do with your current research and from what I saw, um, your current uh, project that you have with ERC and the uh, um, and Princeton as well was uh, this notion of uh, the possibility of literature as archive, right? Uh, you also mentioned this in your introduction and uh, you mentioned uh, this archival churn, right? I think, uh, yes, that's the, mm -hmm. the, the name, right? Um, I, I would like to know if you could talk a little bit about more, uh, a little bit more about this and especially uh, about how this notion uh, of archive is related to historical archive both in, uh, uh, I mean, in, in dialogue with history, but also how it's distinguished from uh, a historical archive, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, perhaps, uh, I don't know if this has a direct link uh, to uh, another, another uh, uh, term that appears in your research, which is uh, memorial culture. Mm -hmm. Um, it, I mean, how do these notions of archive uh, memory, um, history, and mm -hmm. fiction interrelate in your research? Okay, yeah. big, big question, and yes. it's a, you know, fa fascinating question. So, um, let me Try and say, so, so one of the things that we always encounter if as scholars we're interested in the histories of marginalized uh, peoples, it's always this question, especially if we're looking at this from a historical perspective, is you know what, what are the texts that we have access to? And so for the longest time, I mean, if you're looking at Said, this is what he's doing. He's looking at the canon and he's looking at how essentially references to um, the colonized territories sort of appear on the margins of these works. And what I'm trying to do in this sort of more entangled perspective is actually to sort of inquire a little bit, okay, what are some of the texts that we have access to? And I'm not trying to say, I mean, what I am doing is in the book is I do have four couplings of always a canonical and a transatlantic writer. This, however, does not mean, of course, that on the whole, that there was a balance between these voices, you know, not at all. Obviously, there's only very, very few documents um, that we have access to. And this is the result of archiving and uh, sort of the, the ways in which archives are the result of violent, uh, you know, exclusions. And so obviously, within the system of enslavement, um, the histories, the cultural memories, of enslaved peoples were actively suppressed. Cultural expression was disallowed. People were disallowed from speaking their languages. 
But nonetheless, in various forms, they have transmitted stories through song, through different kinds of forms. And some of them, and four of these writers I look at in the book, have also published, and there's more, and you know, there's more others that I haven't considered um, in the book. Um, and so we have to find, I think, a balance here. I think so there is, there's on the one hand, a lot of emphasis on the gaps in the archive and what this means for us as contemporary scholars. And I think one way in which people react to this is, of course, this question also as critics, we might have to speculate or we might, you know, um, Sadia Hartman very famously uses this word of critical fabulation where um, we can't let the records of the historical archive simply stand and speak for themselves because the historical archive is the result of a racist framework, of a framework of exclusion, right? And so I think if we want to counter these things, we also have to create a more maybe self-reflexive context. And so what I've tried to do is actually in many ways um, emphasize the contribution to our understanding of literiness of these authors. So I'm reading them maybe quite um, radically in entanglement with very canonical sources of the English. So, so, I mean, with the example of Austin and Wedderburn, obviously Wedderburn's book is not a domestic novel. But what I'm trying to say is, if we want to understand the gaps and the, and, and the, the sort of in something like Austin, we have to also look at the sort of accounts that happened at the same time. We cannot just always understand this as something that only happens in post-colonial writing in the second half of the 20th century, which is this notion of writing back. So we have a lot of books from more contemporary writers, from writers in the 20th century who started, you know, famously, I don't know, White Sargasso Sea, but also, of course, like, you know, this whole genre of the neo-slave narrative where there's, you know, lots and lots of, you know, and this, these are great texts. I'm not trying to dismiss them, but these, this is mostly the way we understand this. As, and, and this is, I think, a problem of sort of a historical hegemony that we somehow imagine that sort of the whole cultural repertoire belonged to white people until the 20th century and black people only challenged these things in you know what once sort of decolonization happens but this is of course not the fact and this is the same thing we have to understand slavery as something that was always challenged you know no human like this is i think a really problematic way of talking about enslavement also when we you know when people talk about authors like Austin, they would say, well, it was normal at her moment in time, or this is she's, you know, this is this is a um, a sign of the times. That of course assumes that at you know during the time when people were enslaved, that there was no resistance, and that is of course entirely wrong. Um, but we have these conceptions because we have such little representation of re resistance, right? And this is, I think, where this question of archive. Um, comes in and so i do think um if we want to produce maybe a more you know a more critical um framework of the rise of the novel then we should also try out to sort of counterbalance it to entangle it and this is again not to romanticize the author so if you allow me just a little but longer i would try like to say a little bit about memorial culture here because what's interesting is so I am not a trained archivist. None of the four authors, so Olada Equiano, Ignacio Sancho, um, Robert Wedderburn, and Mary Seacole, all of these authors' texts are edited books. You can like, especially Equiano, but also Mary Seacole, you know, you can get the Penguin edition. These are not, you know, hidden texts by now. A lot of people have done this work already, um, especially in the 1980s, finding, editing these texts. So they are available. But what happens now very often is that they get reduced to these kind of poster children of sort of early Black agency. And it's done often in a very reductive kind of manner, in a, in a manner that does not close, sort of takes their texts as seriously as they should. As sort of, I'm, I'm, no, I'm also trying to emphasize in the book, these four authors have aesthetically different projects. They have politically different projects. They're sort of based in different contexts. What happens today in British memorial culture is Britain is so happy to commemorate um, 
the abolition of the slave trade without sort of acknowledging that it was slavery that they sort of profited on so, so massively that necessitated abolition, right? And this is the same problem is if we now sort of take, you know, we have a statue now of Mary Seacole in London, et cetera, right? So there's a lot of, you know, um, there's now a certain kind of visibility, but it's what I've been calling in, in the beginning of the talk, a kind of self-congratulatory in, uh, uh, visibility politics here, because the fact that we have access to these authors' stories and that there are just so few authors' stories is also testament to, to the fact of how many other stories have been lost. Perfect. Thank you for that. No, I'm just really sorry. Just a quick, I'm going to, a quick yeah. interruption. I want to ask a follow up question about that. Guys, just to let you know, uh, we've sorted out the form and we just uh, uh, included the, the, the list again and the form is now open, okay? Um, so yeah, so uh, this, is, this is actually interesting and I think it leads to the next question that I wanted to ask, right? Um, I, I really like the ways that you, um, that you consider in, 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 in both uh, uh, works, right, Mansfield uh, uh, Park and the Horrors of Slavery, these uh, um, formal aspects, right, of both novels. Uh, um, but then I think this question, uh, I wanted to talk about the different genres in, uh, in, 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 these, in these works, right? We have a novel, a country house, or a domestic novel, um, as you said, and uh, um, in Wedderburn's uh, case, a piece of autobio uh, well autobi autobiographical writing, um, and I think uh, uh, and I I wanted to know I mean in terms uh, I understand the, the 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 entanglement right this familial uh, feel the entanglement of this notion of f familial uh, uh, feeling right, but uh, how do these very different genres um, let's say, I, I wouldn't say in perhaps influence or contribute to these different, uh, representations of these, uh, familial feelings and this relationship to the nation. And of course, this also has to do with the notion of authorship, right? Uh, um, and, uh, um, of course, Austin as a canonical writer and, uh, um, and Wedderburn as a, 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 I think from what you said, I don't know his work, but more uh, 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 renowned for uh, as an or orator, right? And uh, this this support of the pamphlet, for yeah. example, right? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, I think generally, I mean, there's this a whole debate around this, this, this whole question of the rise of the novel framework a little bit, right? What are the, like, what are we interested in if we're looking at the history of the book and the history of literacy, right? We can, I mean, we can also look at this in the sense of what were most people reading, right? And a lot of this stuff is no longer around. We're not no longer interested in a lot of popular fiction um, that, that really sold really well during the 19th century, for instance, right? So I think there's also a misconception of some of the authors like, you know, Austin that, that have become so hyper canonical as sort of the, the one thing that people would have um, consumed most readily. So I think that is certainly something. So I think this notion of the, um, the public sphere and the marketplace that is, of course, related to print culture. I mean, there's so many um, critics now who say, yes, but we also have to see how journalism, pamphlets, who all of these things sort of added to this kind of new literacy, to this new form of sort of a, a reading public. So I think that for me, the question is not so much whether these things are necessarily in, um, let's say, I don't think we have to construct like this, this big gap between them. Obviously, there is a form in which we have the development of the novel form that follows generic conventions, as you mentioned, from the country house novel to the domestic novel. And a lot of black writing or the, the early black writing that we have does not necessarily sit easily in that because we have authors like 
um, Equiano, who sort of more traditionally still follows the notion of the sort of slave narrative, um, although a lot of people have also commented on the very hybrid form of his text. Um, you have Ignacio Sancho, who's a letter writer in the 18th century and much more um, a part of this sort of exchange between letters. Then you have sort of Wedderburn, again, as you say, who's like really sort of maybe the, the most awkward author. And then later you have Mary Seacole, who publishes um, this travelogue. And just to sort of maybe pick up on her book, right? Her book was very popular during her lifetime. Um, and I connected to Dickens and I, I read Bleak House, but I also read um, Dickens's um, American notes that he wrote while he was traveling. So it's also interesting that an author like Dickens that we associate so strongly with the Victorian novel, he was also, you know, he also published a travelogue and that was also a very um, popular form. So I think we also have to be careful not to single out the novel from all of the other forms of print culture with which they were entangled. I mean, again, of course, there is a consolidation of a certain kind of generic framework um, that is specific to the novel, but I do think the novel emerges from the 18th to the 19th, sort of to the more formal realist conventions of the 19th century. It emerges in conversation with other forms of print culture. And that's maybe sort of a little bit also what I'm trying to show in the book. Can, can I hop in? Because I have a question yeah, on, 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 on the theoretical oh. framework of the rest of the novel. This is, which as Julia knows, is a sort of obsession, uh, of a sort of personal obsession. But for, first of all, uh, Professor uh, Hashemi Yakani, thank you very much for this thought provoking presentation. And I, I think I would like to for ground a category that, to my mind, saturates or structures your reassessment of the emergence of the novel. This category is, of course, to my mind, Britishness. Mm -hmm. with, with, with the unleash of nationalist and post-colonial approaches to literary history, Britishness has had a very, a, a, a very, very bad press. Uh, your marvelous study, to my mind, more or less rehabilitates the notion of Britishness as an intrinsically multicultural, multi-ethnic, and, as you have proved, multiracial, political, cultural, and literary construct that inherently posits if not commonality, at least entanglement between peoples of different continents. Uh, thus, uh, I, I would like to ask you why Britain and Britishness as categories have been almost completely absent from the so-called classical historical theory of the novel. So from, I don't know, from Ian Watt down yeah. to Patrick Parinder which correlates the advent of the novel to processes that are arguably restricted to the perceived seat of the UK and of the British Empire, which is England, of course. To classical theorists of the novel, the rise of the novel is famous, is famously or in, in fam or in famous or infamous, infamously correlated to the rise of capitalism, the middle classes, literacy, domesticity, so on and so forth. Those processes, however, were vestigial or non-existent in places such as the Scottish Highlands or British Andorras. Uh, I, I wonder whether you could comment this, uh, how the positing of Britishness as a political, cultural, and literary category could turn the hereditary theorizations of the novel upside down. Sorry for this very troubled and so searching question. But I, think, yeah, that is a, I mean, it's a good question and it's, and it's a difficult question to answer. Okay, so I want to be um, quite clear in a way that my, I think my project tries not not to romanticize Britishness at all. I mean, I think the the, the book cover is 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 shattering the British Isles, right? It's sort of a, it's a sh so. I think um, in many ways, um, you know, it's it's a weird. And if we look at this rise of the novel framework and sort of more generally the kind of debates that we have, I think there is an interesting. Um, maybe sort of different approaches in understanding generic formations and sort of maybe a more um, post-structuralist European sort of understanding of generic conventions and a maybe more materialist kind of British understanding. And in some ways, I've tried to do sort of both with the book. 
Um, and so, yes, I do come back to these questions of, you know, how literally, how did the emergence of empire, how did, you know, how did this emergence of culture and Said, I mean, obviously also did this in culture and empire, saying how these two things are intertwined. So I'm not trying to rehabilitate Britishness. I think what I'm trying to say is Britishness was from the beginning much more like this idealized version of Britishness was much more transnational so then we often tend to believe so it's not that Britishness exists in a vacuum and is then exported to the world in, in the form of you know colonial education and people learning English and people being forced to read English and read classics um, and then again as I said writing back only later on the English actively sort of the, the English self-understanding came to pass in entanglement, in the colonial endeavor. It's, sort of, it's especially in this transition from the 18th century, um, where sort of in Dickens, this is really interesting, where, where he's very critical of sort of the, the colonial lag of the United States that hadn't abolished slavery when he was visiting, and a fervent sort of more patriotic embrace of sort of this imperial project. And I think this is sort of the, the paradox of Britishness that tends to like to think of itself as this sort of closed off entity that, that embarked on the civilizing mission. And this is to this day it sort of shapes debates. And so I'm, I wanna take a much more hesitant and much more queer critical perspective on this, on this sort of, in many ways, fantasy of sort of a, a British um, um, exceptionalism. So. Um, of course, I'm saying Britishness is multiracial and it is and it is transnational and many sort of historically in a much longer line than we like to say. But I don't necessarily understand this as a as a celebratory positive thing. Right. That's my sort of that's my concern. I think this is it's exactly the other way around. If we're looking at the memorial culture, this is what often happens now is see, you know, there were all these great authors already in the 18th and 19th century. So I think um, yeah, I want to. I want to sort of. Uh, I think this this entanglement in this way is is a more um, is a more hesitant uh, question. And then I think that the second part of, um, yeah, this critique of how the rise of the novel, of how we frame this theoretically, I think here too. I think we have really different schools here, right? We have a sort of again, as I said, a more material materialist school that is interested in. What are the conditions of literacy? What are the, the, the media? What is how does print culture evolve? Who could read? Who could write? Authorship, right? And, you know, again, with someone like Austin, of course, during her lifetime, it was a much, you know, it's not as if Austin, you know, as a woman author, just simply, you know, could have published anything she wanted and had like a very easy time, right? So, of course, we have to think about these things. And then we have, of course, sort of a more theoretical tradition going back to people like Bakhtin that you know talk about sort of the the in sort of the novel as the form that inherently has this uh, sort of uh, uh, polyphony where we have different um, sides and I think for me actually in, and I tried in the book not to make the strong distinction between these traditions of um, of novel criticism because I think too like again with the Austin reading I think it's important to understand the historical context but then when I was trying to read, for instance, the narrative voice versus the character focalizer, I think that would be, again, a very tradition, like maybe traditional sort of literary criticism, lit critique that highlights what the novel form on an aesthetic, on a formal um, aspect does, namely incorporating these different viewpoints, right? And maybe on a final note, Wedderburn, of course, is not a novelistic writer, but this is interesting because he does this too. He just invents these different viewpoints. He also does a lot of things that we can um, bring into conversations with polyphony, right? So I think for me, um, and this is just sort of maybe an eclectic eclecticism, but I take whatever is out there in terms of understanding these texts. I don't know if that answered your question sufficiently. Yes. Yes, thank you so much. No, I, I, I was just I was just saying that your your, your study rehabilitates Britain as a, 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 as a category, not mm -hmm. as a not as a political project, but as a category that needs to be present in any theoretical uh, uh, mm -hmm. assessment of the advent of the novel, which tends to be absent in, in, in classical studies such as Watts, for instance. Okay. This is what I, this is what I intended to say. But thank you so much. Mm -hmm. thank you.
Yes. In fact, I think you show this very clearly in your analysis of Mansfield Park, how much of uh, uh, this uh, this trans this, this notion of uh, uh, Brit Britishness in a transatlantic context really is uh, 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 crucial for uh, the the characters' relationship. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, in the novel, and especially in the ways that uh, uh, we understand class and race in the novel, right? So th this is a, I think this is a good, uh, a very productive way of looking into Britishness, right? Instead of antagonizing British uh, Britishness versus uh, colonies or uh, colonized or uh, or uh, uh, post-colonial relations, mm -hmm. but rather understand how how uh, these colonial relations were actually uh, 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 fundamental to understand to, for this notion of Britishness that, that we know today, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's a yeah. very good yeah, I think so. This, this sort of the, the contemporaneity of this, like it happens, like it's sort of, again, as I say, I think this correlation of how these, um, things interact. This is quite important, right? But sort of British culture emerges in the sort of colonial endeavor, right? I think that is really something that is quite um, important. And that, that again, I think is a misunderstanding often in how some people understand post-colonial criticism to, to, to function. Excellent. Um, so I, I think I'm going to, I'm going to move on to some of the questions yeah. that we have. Uh, I'm going to start with our a uh, very dear colleague and friend, uh, Luciana villas Boas, who's also a professor at our department. Uh, Luciana asks, thank you very much for, for your talk. I was wondering if you could expand on the metaphor and tangled tonalities used to describe your approach. While Said's contrapuntal reading is derived from music, your metaphor is derived from painting. Uh, could you elaborate on the representational advantages of entangled tonality, uh, tonalities besides its emphasis on synchronicity? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I was quite um, uh, influenced by authors who also look into affect. Um, mm. And I think this notion of tone of a text is, is a really interesting one and obviously also one that we find in literary um, criticism quite uh, as well. And so I think, I mean, we've, I call this familiar feeling, right? And the question is a little bit, what sorts of feelings does a text um, evoke, right? And I think um, the metaphor of painting is, is, a, is, a, is a really good one. And I think um, what I've tried to explain here is we can have paintings that, that um, on the surface, use quite different techniques. So this is a little bit my point with, for instance, Wedderburn and Austin, they are not similar necessarily in how they work. And yet, for me, both of them um, can engender resisting tonalities. And this is, of course, a different, this, this question of the tone of a text is a really difficult thing because it's the question, you know, we can, of course, talk about, you know, comedy or or, or or drama right as sort of two different opposing tones but there is there's also a way where um you know literary critics like um cn Dai talk about ugly feelings and sort of the question of you know she's talking about the sort of the um the sort of the lacking tonality of authors like melville like modernists that don't have any that don't demonstrate any feeling and i was very interested in how we can look at these texts not necessarily um through the metaphors um of um of sort of the musicality that 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 um in the in the in the saidian sort of idea is often sort of this 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 way of um that you mentioned also your colleague mentioned about synchronicity but i think also for me tone is um and tonality is again as i say quite interesting by emphasizing maybe the the difference and still get interestingly entangled effects. So as I say, in the book, it's sort of four different tonalities that I look at. It's foundations in the faux um, and equiano um, in the way that which they set sort of a very foundational aspect of how we think about, for instance, literary realism, right? So this debate about, I mean, in what? It is, of course, the faux who sets the prime example of what a realist introspection is, right? 
Um, he gives us psychological insight, etc. And I think what's interesting is it is so focused on the individual that it actually overlooks that this sort of solipsism of Daniel Defoe's um, Robinson Crusoe is actually in many ways not realistic at all. It's actually very strongly still um, tied to the maybe more romantic or sort of romance tradition of wish fulfillment. Whereas Equiano's narrative, because he constantly has to negotiate with other people, because as an initially unfree human being, he's writing his story as someone who's not yet a subject, right? And so the book has to negotiate his subject status. It has ne to negotiate individuality. And in this way, for instance, in that chapter, I argue it's actually much more foundational for our understanding of sort of a literary kind of um, realist understanding of a psyche um, than the foe. Um, and so, again, I would say there is an entanglement here um, and, and also sort of with regard to tone. So I think tone and tonality for me um, describes aesthetic projects that are inherent in the text without proclaiming that they are uh, need to be stylistically or generically the same, but they attribute, but they, but they both these texts from often different perspectives add to a similar understanding of what can happen in writing. So foundations in the foe um, and Equiano, digressions and Stern and Sancho, and as I mentioned today, resistances in um, Austin and Wedderburn, and then um, consolidations and Dickens and Seacole. So it's somehow I think it's both this, um, it's an emphasis more on the uh, on the disc discrepant ways in which you can create a similar tone. I don't know if that makes any sense. Thank you, Luciana has a a, a follow up question. Sure. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so would you relate your own work with recent research on effective public spheres? Yes, I can give like, finally, I can give a short answer. I would say yes. <laughs> For me, literature <laughs> certainly is a, such a work. And I think we can, in, in some ways, my work, I understand my work to be sort of a historical version of that kind of work. Perfect. Um, okay, so but I, I, I do I do want to ask another question. I don't know if Tiago has a question. I don't want to. I don't want to be be my selfish. be my guest. Be be, be, be be selfish, please, Julie. Yes, <laughs> no, we are all, thing, we are all, all learning from our guest. Yes, no, I, I mean one thing that I that I found really interesting in your analysis as well is how you bring in a. a a very productive debate of queer theory that uh, leaves the realm of queer theory and <laughs> queer literature, which I think is incredibly important, right? Uh, um, well, for for many reasons, I'm not going to discuss here. But uh, um, and uh, um, and 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 then I think this is a crucial relationship in the book, right? this uh, relationship between queer theory um, and uh, what you call familial feeling, mm -hmm. which uh, um, for many queer theories would be something um, that wouldn't dialogue with each other because one is so heteronormative and the other uh, anti-normative mm -hmm. uh, theoretically. And, um, and I think, um, and how this discuss, and I, I think it has to do with what you were saying about effect, right? Um, so can you talk a little bit more about, I mean, I haven't read the, the, the conclusion of your book, and I know that you expand on that in the conclusion, but can you talk a little bit about that, right? How uh, working with queer theory, and I know your background is in queer theory, uh, um, and uh, uh, relate this to a, to such uh, an important uh, feature of uh, the rise of the novel and the novel itself, especially in the 18th and 19th centuries, which is the, the realm of the family, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that, about this, uh, your use of queer theory yeah. and yeah. Uh, uh, um, and how you use this in your research? Yeah, thank you, Julia. Yeah, I think um, 
I mean, sort of anecdotally, at some point in the very beginning of this project, it was called Queer Entanglements. Um, and I, would, I was getting this question a lot where people were saying, but you don't write about queer people or the representation of queer sexuality. Um, and so I think you're quite right. So the, 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 this notion of queerness has a lot to do with the role of negative affects that I think your colleague also mentions in terms of the public sphere. Um, and I think it is quite interesting in a way that we see that, um, of course, like, you know, part of why the, the family and sort of sentimental versions of the family are so, uh, you know, are so dominant is sort of their, their, their kind of attractiveness in terms of the kinds of stories that they tell. Um, and I think it's really interesting to see that um, oftentimes um, this becomes a really difficult entryway, right? I mean, when, you know, especially if, you look, if we're looking at the 18th and the 19th century, Black people are dehumanized to the degree that they're not recognized as human beings, right? And so both this notion of claiming the capacity to feel and the right to belong to a family are really sort of crucial entryways or crucial modes of resistance. However, and this is sort of the second point would be then you can do this by sort of appealing to a kind of white sentimentality. And this is, of course, something that happened quite a bit in abolitionist writing. And that is mostly abolitionist writing also by white author who, who used very, very demeaning sort of um, um, paternalistic depictions of black suffering. Right. And the, um, but the, but it's also, of course, something that the black authors like Equiana, like Seiko, like um, uh, Sancho, like all of them struggle with in one shape or another. And I think their writing, what I'm trying to, to, to show in the book is we need to be, um, you know, we need to read these texts as complex forms of articulation of these kinds of feelings and not just sort of saying, okay, um, Equiano calls himself almost an Englishman and he's appealing to all of this kind of sentimentality. They're also doing other things. Same thing with Seacole. You know, people criticize Seacole a lot, saying, well, she was a nurse in the British Army, sort of, right? And of course, there, are, there is a sort of a limited form of agency within this, but I think their discourses also disrupt Britishness, you know, that sort of comes back to what we were saying before. They also disrupt gendered and sexualized notions that were heteronormative and partly, for instance, through, you know, mixed raceness and mixed raceness can be something that is that is sort of very um, is a very violent sort of discourse, of course, within the context of the plantation economy. But it is also something that is Interesting. I mean, Sancho writes about um, black men in the 18th century who had an, uh, who, you know, who had affairs with, with sort of, you know, more well-to-do white women, right? So there is also a way in which these kinds of narratives intervene. And then maybe just the final say about how queerness comes in um, to is again, as I say, this this contemporary version. How do we talk about these authors today? Um, and I think sort of the, the queer approach, again, as I say, is not is trying to grant sort of um, valid, validity to negative, negative affects and validity to sort of a certain kind of ambivalence when it comes to these notes. So again, as I say, that's why I'm very, um, you know, Equiano is a good point, uh, you know, example again. He was, when, when his writing was first edited and became more popular, he was almost always read as sort of, um, an African American, like or the, the you know the first the first kind of like slave narrative within that sort of context of the African American slave narrative, and then sort of more and more people said, well, no, he's very, he's you know he's claiming himself to be an Englishman, and so we should we should claim him as a Black British author, right? Um, and I think for me the queer thing here to do is of course to to ask what is the investment of the nation state and the, into this sort of kind of subject. Right. And so I think that, so, you know, again, long answer for me, you know, could be quite short, but it's, of course, the anti normative aspect of this that that is quite interesting. The, um, the interest in disrupting categories, the interest in disrupting a very um, linear notion also of emancipation. Right. It's not as if we're sort of it's getting better and better and better. I think, again, especially if we're looking about these discourses in relation to 
um, the backlash around, you know, when I was starting this book, we didn't have Brexit, we didn't have, you know, we didn't have the debates that we're having now with regard of who can belong to Britain and who can't. I mean, maybe just as a final, you know, point in case, the whole Windrush scandal in, you know, that, that came up in Britain. I mean, that speaks to, this is how I understand familiar feeling, because it's interesting. Familiar feeling, in many ways, is always based on conditional belonging that is that never extends to whiteness right as a white person you always have sort of a secure place within sort of a, a national sort of framework the black people the black people who migrated to britain you know 50 60 years ago we we saw that with the windrush scandal if there is a will to challenge their form of belonging to the nation then this is possible and i think um, from a queer perspective or from, from, a, from a, also a black radical perspective, this doesn't come as a surprise. So familiar feeling in many ways is, is not a, is not a um, uh, sort of, again, as I said, it's not, it should not be conflated as like a, like a romantic version, but it's much more interested in this question of what are the effective um, constructions of whose belonging is, give, is, is taken for granted and whose belonging is always conditional. Excellent, thank you. And just uh, um, to finish, uh, uh, to fish, finish up, we, we don't want to take any more of your time. Although this discussion is really interesting, we have two more questions mm -hmm. here. Um, so uh, one of them is from Dot and Can Kangaroo. Um, the marriage between cousins, uh, like in Mansfield Park, was considered incestuous during the nineteenth century. No, it wasn't. I mean, it's like this term, this incest. So there's a lot of debate, of course, with Edmund, with the, the pairing of Fanny and, and Edmund. No, so it was, of course, possible for, for um, uh, it wasn't, it was often the only way of maintaining this. So the term incestuous here doesn't mean necessarily the incest taboo. It means sort of more how endogamy and the passing on of property at that period of time actually often necessitated these close alliances. So one of the things in Mansfield Park that is so interesting is how, I mean, with the Ward sisters, they start off sort of on the same level, but through the marriages, mm -hmm. the, uh, the sisters end up in completely different class um, and financial situations. And so, so historians of class sort of say the specific British sort of system of prom uh, primogenitor where everything is passed on to the sort of oldest son creates a very problematic sort of notion of how property is passed on and and, and this is i mean this is all the drama in the mm -hmm. austin novels is that you know mostly the women have to make these i mean the men too they have to make the matches yeah. in order to sort of pass on and and the way this functions is is sort of this this is what people have called is this it, it remains this kind of incestuous little england world that that doesn't that seems so when, when we look at the pairings lo looks it looks so small but I think if we're again looking at where the wealth that is passed on, when we look at how this works, it is of course much bigger. Fanny's brother is going to the Navy, right? He's also sending the shawl from India and all of those things, right? So the the the, the colonial sphere is is never is, is always there, right? So it's not literally sort of a taboo, but it's more to just sort of a more metaphor to describe of how these family relationships are um, uh, imagined. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and then a final question. This is from an, one of our students. Uh, my, my question is, how do you think you can make contrapuntal reading? Uh, no, sorry, how do you think contrapuntal reading is properly done in a way that you can analyze the non-told uh, part of the novel without falling into pure speculation? Yeah, I mean, that's a good, I mean, so on the one hand, I actually think speculation is not the worst thing. And I think we don't have to be mm -hmm. so afraid. I mean, this is now a big debate in literary scholars. In the book, I have a whole section on this new debate on or new work. It's not that new, but, you know, critics like Heather Love, I think, you know, I, I bring in under this rubric of surface reading. So I think, you know, in the 80s and 90s, of course, post-structuralist reading became all about subtext. Right and became all about speculating. And I think what has happened um, in in sort of the, the more recent years is that, that there was quite a bit of a backlash against this notion that people, as you say, sort of uh, some of these readings were were uh, perceived to be 
essentially sort of making things up. Um, I don't know that I have such a strong opinion about one or the other. There is some sort of deconstructive reading that is quite speculative that I think can be quite revealing. On the other hand, when I, you know, when I when I do teach literature, I of course also try and um, ingrain in us with sort of with Eve Sedgwick, and this is maybe again the other sort of big queer influence on this book, the the reparative, right, where she says, um, you know, reading literature has to in some ways have a connection to the real right and i think this has to do with the with the words on the page um and i think that was i i tried to do this a little bit with relation for instance to this question of the silence in the book right so i think we can i don't think there is one answer on how to read this passage um but i do think people have oftentimes kind of sort of assumed they understood what the passage was without sort of going back to it. And I think there is, of course, this, this sort of maybe there is something sort of also conservative in me where I would say there is something in the close reading of actually looking what is in the text um, and reacting to this. But again, someone like Cedric would also say, you know, the reparative then is also to speculate about meanings that might not be inherent in the text, right? This is what queer people, this is what queer reading has been all about. It has been about sort of finding sustenance in a culture that was very often heteronormative, was you know what was sort of disavowing people. So I think that is that that for me is sort of maybe the um, the challenge here. So I guess yeah, reading always means you know engaging with the text, but I also think we have um, we also have to you know we have to also speculate and we also have to work with text although otherwise you know it, it just becomes like an um, an exact science which which literary studies never can be perfect thank you for that um well i think Tiago, would you like to to ask a question or no, comment I, on I, something? I, I, I think that's a perfect end note actually you know yes. <laughs> I, 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 I think that what it's, it's a nice way for us to complete this very thought-provoking and insightful conversation and I, I hope that our students take into their hearts uh, yes know. I was going to say that <laughs> I was going to say that <laughs> I hope they're listening <laughs> well thank you so much um, for having me and no, thank you for uh, for your your talk. Um, as Chago said, it was very thought provoking, very interesting. Oh yes, by the way, uh, before we finish, uh, Elaine's uh, new book, Familiar Feeling, is available for download, free download, at uh, on this link here. And um, I also want to give you the link to her. Um, to her book about intersectionality, which is also open access. Um, so here are both links. Um, and thank you so much for your talk and for your time. It was a, a really fruitful discussion. Uh, we're really happy that you um, that your um, that you that we made this happen, right? That we arranged some time and we got. Uh, you got you to, to to participate in our in our in our circle. Thank you so much, and thank you for everyone who was watching. This is the last Kritiko Homansi of the semester. We'll be back at the end of August. So um, yes, so please do fill out the form in case you, if you want to receive our emails, and uh, we look forward to seeing you guys soon. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.